briefing has been about technology and the training system life cycle. We are at an exciting crossroads in the application of new technologies to training. Remember, though, that the ultimate goal of any training system is to make a positive change in the learner. And reaching this goal will provide your organization with a clear competitive advantage. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Strebridge. As he has pointed out, we are fortunate that as technology advances, it not only can do more things, it also often becomes less expensive and easier to use, more user and budget friendly. Students who learn in a positively designed and operated learning environment are better employees, citizens, and managers. Careful design, integration, installation, training, operation, maintenance, and system evolution make today's technology very different from the cumbersome, expensive, and often counterproductive technology of early experiments a generation or two ago. We now invite participants at our many satellite downlink sites to offer us questions and comments. You may direct questions to any of our three panelists or to the panel in general. What do you want to know about applications of modern instructional technology? Please call or fax us now at the numbers you see on your screen. We have a live call already uh, from uh, Wasave, the Colegio de Bacheleras de Sinaloa, Wasave, Sinaloa. Welcome. Thank you very much. We have two questions. What is the percentage that you recommend us to apply the constructivism and the theoretical in a method of teaching learning. Um, and another question would be, what features, what uh, basic features should the instruments have? I mean, the instruments to evaluate learning for those programs of modern technology by using, using computers. That sounds like a question, uh, uh, two questions, uh, particularly aimed at uh, Dr. Dodge. Uh, Bernie, the constructivism first question. Uh, I don't think I can recommend a percentage. It really depends on your goals. So recognize that in teaching with constructivism, you're actually teaching two sets of things. One is the actual content, as in the tape on archetype, the kids were learning about the ancient world. But they were also learning a set of processes, the ability to work together, to reason together, and to make inferences. And so how you evaluate that and what percentage you allocate to constructivism versus direct instruction really depends on what your intentions are. I just spent a week in New York trying to evaluate that program that you saw. And uh, the way to do it is, is to, to ask the kids to produce essays, to produce concept maps to interview them and to, to try to get at the depth of their of their thinking. But um, also, if you want to see the extent to which they can generalize those thinking skills to other situations, then what you do is present them with an ambiguous problem situation uh, in a content area that's different than the one they just learned from and see how well they do with it. We're in the process of doing that at two sites right now as well. Uh, do you want to comment anymore on the features for evaluation uh, that were included in the second uh, uh, question? The, it's really a matter of evaluation of constructivism uh, is, is the single most difficult uh, issue. When, when we're teaching things the traditional way, then all we need to do is ask multiple choice questions and, and we know what people know. But uh, the issue of evaluation is, is still very difficult. It's complex. And uh, you know, I, in many schools, uh, what they do is portfolio assessment. They ask, they ask the learners to produce a variety of things. And you, you evaluate it by looking at the big picture, at the whole picture. And that's, that's about as good as we can do at this point. We have a question from uh, Chiapas, uh, the Instituto Tecnologico de Tuxtla Gutierrez in Chiapas. Welcome. The question has to do with the first part. It's, uh, do you consider that this new CTB is a 
applicable to all sciences, for example, math? This is the end of the question. Gracias por la pregunta. Thank you. Uh, that's an appropriate question. Uh, who would like to tackle it? The use of uh, video for all sciences. Bill? Well, obviously the more abstract the subject matter, it, it, at first uh, blush it would seem much more difficult to put something in pictorial or graphic form. but. I think you're going to find, and if you look at the materials that are available, more and more you are seeing people, particularly using um, developing materials on the computer, using animation, um, developing single concept uh, videotapes to teach uh, difficult, difficult processes, difficult concepts. So while the while at, at first glance you might think that uh, math, for example, is, is difficult to use in, in this way, um, I, I think there are a lot of things that can be done. Um, there, are, there are other techniques, um, not necessarily television, but other techniques like using rods and, and so on uh, for math, teaching math concepts that, that, that people have found very effective. So uh, I wouldn't I don't think I think one has to be careful not to get hung up on some particular technology. I like to think of uh, if you give a kid a hammer, he or she is going to find a lot of things that need pounding. If you start with a particular technology, uh, it, it might not really be an appropriate application of that technology. You need to. We've all been talking about the need to start with what are the outcomes that you're looking for. What are, what are the objectives that you have in mind for your for your uh, teaching learning process. If you start there, then you'll probably be able to find an appropriate technology to apply to, uh, to this situation. Bernie? Uh, a few weeks ago, I interviewed a number of uh, kids who were using a, a program called Geometry Supposer. And uh, what that does, it's a computer-based uh, tool and it provides an environment in which you can sort of discover and invent geometry, uh, essentially taking the place of rulers and protractors and so on. And what the kids were able to do in that situation was to, to make some guesses, to begin to try to prove various uh, geometry uh, axioms. And what I found in interviewing them was that they, they owned that topic. Because they had discovered uh, the, 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 the proofs that they, had, they were making in that, in that environment, they felt some ownership of it, and it really, uh, I believe, will stick with them far longer than if they were just being taught, you know, here's how to go through a proof, and, and uh, without the benefit of the technology to provide that, that, that uh, world for them. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Guadalajara, this time at our downlink site at the Comisión Federal de Electricidad División Jalisco, Guadalajara. Welcome. We have two questions for you. First, is it possible to access immediately to these uh, educational technologies at all levels, or do you have to go step by step? That's the first question. And the second question would be when the mass media, mass communication media are so manipulated and so controlled, what can you do for them to really be a, an educational tool? This, this has some relationship with the politics um, in, in a general sense. Is, this is it. Thank you. Thank you. The first question uh, is the question of uh, uh, the introduction of, of this uh, at once or in steps. Uh, what kind of strategy do you recommend that way? Well, I've um, uh, implemented quite a number of different technologies, um, and it, it doesn't really matter which technology that you start with. Uh, I think that they all can be approached. Uh, I think that there is uh, certainly uh, a requirement to have a step-by-step -step approach. One of the things that, that Bernie mentioned earlier was start off with a situation where you think you can find a clear win. If you start off in an organizational implementing instructional technology, uh, with a situation where you can get a win right off the bat, uh, that'll make things much, much easier. And the second question, which is one somewhat dear to my heart personally, uh, 
in the environment of the mass media today, you have students coming to you who are already being bombarded with media messages of all kinds out there. Mm -hmm. How does that affect the educational process? Well, different subject areas, I think, are going to uh, look at this in different ways. But I, I can think of, for example, I, I'm a former uh, social studies teacher uh, a few years ago. And I could see tremendous opportunities for teaching critical thinking by by examining exactly what you're talking about in terms of the propaganda, if you will, that's being put out by uh, through the media by different political entities and so on. I think it's a, one could look upon it in that sense uh, as an opportunity. And it's, it's certainly a competition against mass media, uh, trying to get the learner's attention. Um, so I think that, uh, that the, it's, it's absolutely imperative for uh, instructors nowadays to use this kind of technology to capture that that attention from their students. I, I think there's there's also the element of time involved. If you uh, the word here in the United States is edutainment, and there is an, an entire industry growing in which we're we're being presented with very splashy graphics and sound and so on, very fast paced but fairly low level learning. And I think you need to not be lured into, into thinking that that is the use of technology, but, but remember archetype, which, which is a much slower paced thing. The graphics are not all that splashy, but, but to, to focus on high quality teaching and generation of questions by the students themselves, uh, that leads you to, to, you know, put your emphasis on that thinking process and less about, less, be less concerned about splashy graphics and, and wonderful sounds. Right. It does uh, remind me of uh, Marshall McLuhan, who 30 years ago commented that uh, the student coming from the environment of the modern media into a traditional paper and pencil and chalkboard classroom feels like he or she is entering a medieval dungeon. Uh, on the other hand, one of the important functions, I think, of education today is to teach critical viewing skills so that the student who comes out of a classroom take some of the skills learned in the classroom of thinking and critically evaluating into their uh, overwhelming media experience in the world outside. We have uh, another live question, this one from Mexicali from the Universidad Autonoma de Baja California in Mexicali. Uh, welcome. Well, well, although the compression and decompression of images have lowered the costs, I understand that the cost or the, the problem of sending via satellite is through dedicated telephone lines, and that is still very expensive. Um, what could you mention about that? Do you think that the cost will go down, or will it continue to be a, an obstacle? Uh, another practical question of, of, of finance, uh, the, the issue of transmitting signals. Uh, we've all faced the idea of wanting to do something and discovering it was simply too expensive. Uh, what is the outlook on that kind of question? Well, I, I think in regard to uh, satellite capacity, it, it's certainly a, uh, an issue of supply and demand. Um, there's a, a limited supply up there, and the demand is going to configure the prices. Uh, the, the question about uh, uh, yeah. using video compression, I think, is, uh, is an important point to make because uh, that's why we're, we're doing teleconferencing, digital compressed teleconferencing systems. Uh, you can compress that video signal. Uh, we're using, a, uh, on today's show, a full transponder on a satellite. Uh, using digital compression, you can use uh, as little as uh, five, six, seven percent of a transponder. So, as the video signal is compressed, so is the uh, the price for that transmission. We have a live question from our neighbors in Tijuana, the Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, Delegación Baja California. Welcome. This question is related to the CTB, and, and the question is, can a CBT module like the one that Dr. Dodge was talking about, can it be implemented by stages, and what would be the equipment or the initial kit 
uh, equipment kit as far as uh, computer equipment and the training and the skill, the human skills necessary to be able to operate this kind of module. Very good. Dr. Dodge. I think you can start uh, a system like that uh, essentially on a shoestring. There is a publisher here uh, named Tom Snyder Productions and Tom Snyder himself was a fourth grade teacher 10 or 15 years ago and he, all of the software that he and his company have developed are designed for a one computer classroom where essentially uh, there, there's one computer, one monitor and the software is fairly simple visually but what it does is to create an environment in which the whole class is talking to each other, debating, and, and uh, trying to arrive at some consensus. Um, I think with fairly simple programming skills, uh, one can create that kind of situation. And, and one computer in a classroom doesn't cost that much. And from that, you can get a lot of mileage where, where the, the real learning is taking place away from the computer in the dialogue and discussion among students. But that takes good design. That takes a good teacher behind uh, the design of such yes. a product. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question by fax now from uh, uh, Chiapas, uh, Pemex uh, Exploracion. Uh, it has to do again with the CBT. Um, after applying the, the uh, computer-based training uh, in the teacher learning, learner process, uh, what suggestions do you have for evaluating students? <clears throat> Again, it's a very difficult thing, and, and I, can, I can report on uh, another situation where we, we've had children going through uh, an eight-week process in which they have created their own software. Uh, they have spent uh, those eight weeks learning about a particular country and pouring all the information they know into a piece of software that, that I developed and creating an adventure game, essentially. Well, how do you figure out what they've learned from this? Uh, it seems to me the only way we can evaluate that is by, by looking at the, the products that they created, by observing almost as an eth ethnographer, an anthropologist, by looking at the classroom and, and watching who is talking to whom and what kinds of things are they saying to each other. And then maybe a year later coming back and seeing, are these kids, are these learners better able to work as a group? Do they know how to honor other people's opinions? Can they start from a very fuzzy situation and make it concrete? If they can do those things, and we, we don't have enough data to know that they do, then I think we're successful. Uh, another live question from uh, uh, La Piedad, the Instituto Tecnologico de La Piedad in uh, Michoacan. Welcome. Uh, could you give us a practical example about the design for creating and evaluating a teaching model that includes a database as, a, as an educational strategy? Inclusion of the database in an educational uh, project, a, a specific example. Uh, can we provide one? Uh, there, there, is, there is one uh, very interesting product that you can read about in the literature uh, developed at Vanderbilt University uh, in the United States. Uh, it's called the Jasper Woodbury series. And essentially, it is a 15 to 20 minute videotape in which a problem is presented. And all of the clues that you need are there in, the, in that initial video. But there's also additional databases. The, the, the programs are about uh, ecology, for example. One of them is called the case of the missing ducks. And by going through a database to find out all of these various clues about why, why the ducks in this particular lake are no longer there, uh, kids are learning uh, in, a, in a very constructivist way uh, how to solve fuzzy problems. And, uh, and so there's, there's one good example. We have a fax question from uh, Universidad de Guadalajara, Jalisco, uh, about accreditation. Is there any kind of accreditation agency for this type of professional activity, some kind of uh, distance consulting, a way of identifying expertise? Well, there's certainly no uh, formal licensing requirement or anything like that. There are uh, organizations in the United States, uh, for example, the Association for Educational Communications and Technology, with headquarters in Washington, D.C., 
would be a possible source of uh, information about uh, competent consultants, but I don't think they would go so far as to recommend a consultant for a particular activity, and they're certainly not in the in the business of uh, certainly not in the business of licensing uh, consultants. Okay. I think another source may be the uh, United States Distance Learning Association. They keep a, keep a pretty complete database of uh, uplink, downlink locations, uh, video conference locations, and uh, consulting expertise. But there's not a formal licensing uh, uh, accrediting uh, body at this point. Uh, we have a question now from Mexico. Uh, the Comisión Federal de Electricidad, uh, Museo Tecnológico in Mexico, uh, DF. Uh, welcome. Yes, the question is the following. How could you use this technology to raise the, the working systems in a, apart from the um, training itself? All right. Um, who would like to comment on, on that uh, uh, interesting question? Well... I, okay. I'll take a okay. shot at that one. I think, if I understand the qu question correctly, what you're wondering is, outside of the training activities, what are what are some ongoing sorts of things that that uh, I guess maybe they'd fall. It's kind of hard to, to say how you're going to do something to somebody without it being called training. Uh, it might not be a formal training program, however, it could be some sort of informal activities. Maybe people are. But maybe people are simply engaging in uh, interactions among themselves, which is not a formal training program. Uh, one of the big things that, one of the ma major ways that people do learn is by what we call networking. Uh, not, not in a certain sort of computer network, but just informal exchange of ideas. And you, learn, you get to know other professionals in the field and you learn from them. So that, that's certainly one way that, that you could uh, continue to to learn outside of a, a formal training activity. Uh, another aspect of it is, you know, when we train somebody, they're there in a classroom and, and uh, we have all of the information in place at that time. That may not be the moment that they need the information. So if part of the training process was to package the information given to them uh, during training, in such a way that they can access it quickly, go immediately to what they need, mm -hmm. when they need it, then you're able to embed and continue the training uh, on the job. So that, that means hypertext systems perhaps, or just, just a database of, of documentation that can go with the learner to, to the job site. Right. Mm -hmm. Portability of training systems is, uh, is really coming into its own now. And one, one point about that, of course, probably still the most portable technology is text. Print materials are, are still the most accessible and, and portable. So you might want to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And we have a call from the uh, from Coahuila, the Instituto Tecnológico de Satillo in Coahuila. Welcome. I would like to know if it is if you need a special training for using the new technologies, in, in which case, what would be, what would be the background, the, require, the pre-requirements and the time necessary? Uh, that's a very practical question. A couple of PhDs sitting here who have more training than most of us can get. Uh, what do you suggest by way of training? Well, the, the short answer is, is, is the long-term answer. We have a master's degree in educational technology, and, and essentially we take people from a variety of backgrounds, but in the course of two or two and a half years, they learn about all of the things that we've talked about here and in, in, in essence become a problem solver across a lot of different media to become an instructional designer. It takes a long-term commitment. It's not the kind of thing that you can pick up in a, in a very short workshop. I think one of the things, too, that is the aspect that I talked about, and that you, you may be needing some sort of uh, support group within your organization, and hiring a professional person to begin establishing a vision of what that uh, support group might do, and also then having them serve in a consultant role to move 
beyond the initial stages, uh, identifying needs, moving into objectives, uh, establishing functions, and then perhaps employing other personnel would be a step-by-step -step, step process by which one could move into using technology. A live question from Leon, the Instituto Tecnologico de Leon. Welcome. Yes, the question is the following. Whether the efficiency of these modern technologies have been compared with other instructional methods and how what have been the results. Thank you. The comparison of uh, the newer technologies with uh, other methodologies, uh, uh, what do we know about that? Uh, I, I think an educational researcher would say that uh, it's, it's, it's almost an unanswerable question because when you're comparing two different methodologies, uh, are you comparing the technology? Are you comparing the instructional methods that underlie the technology? It's difficult to be able to point to one thing and say that made the difference. There, there is research that says that when people use traditional CBT, they can more efficiently use their time and, and get up to speed um, more quickly compared to traditional lectures. And that's probably primarily a question of time on task. The new CBT technologies, constructivism in general, is not, is not, if, is not particularly efficient. It takes a long yeah. period of time. And the payback that we hope for, not fully documented yet, is that in, in taking that longer period of time and allowing deeper processing of what is to be learned, that we will get uh, uh, something that more closely approximates understanding and wisdom. But we don't know yet. Um, perhaps we could return to a fax that, uh, uh, from uh, Monterey uh, that has to do with the question of limited financial resources and uh, updating technology. Um, We've talked about this, uh, the, the cycle uh, mm -hmm. that needs to be uh, scheduled in uh, for the sake of our uh, participants in uh, Monterey. Um, could you expand on that a bit, uh, uh, Rick? Sure. Um, again, after you have your uh, system uh, outcomes down on paper, uh, you can begin looking at the different types of technology. And uh, as I mentioned in my talk about higher and higher levels of integration, uh, there are systems out there that allow you to start with a uh, modest investment, and, but they have a clear upgrade path into the future. So uh, as the budget comes along uh, year by year, uh, you can upgrade those systems to add capabilities. For instance, uh, starting off with a, uh, a video-based uh, classroom. Uh, maybe the next year you add uh, video teleconferencing access to, uh, to that classroom, adding on top, layering on top of the different technologies. We could uh, uh, raise the question also, uh, as has been done from uh, uh, Guadalajara, of uh, strategies for uh, facing uh, restricted budgets, uh, limited budgets, uh, uh, goodwill, but not resources uh, to uh, implement these, and uh, steps that one can take in the process of, of moving toward that. Uh, what what does, do our experts recommend for getting the the initial stages uh, underway? Well, I think one has to consider what we're talking about here as really a an innovation which requires going through an adoption process. And the first step in the process of adopting any innovation is providing information. And I think that whoever is responsible for, whoever is the focal point of the instructional uh, technology activity in that particular setting needs to start out by informing uh, certainly the managers, after all, the decision makers have to have, a, have to have a sense of ownership of this process, as well as giving a sense of ownership to the, to the persons who are doing the training and to the trainees themselves. I can't emphasize this point enough that when you're, when you're establishing any sort of technology group and you're in, in any training program, it has to be something uh, it's certainly related to what Bernie's talking about in this con constructivist uh, uh, 
approach in, in, uh, in using computers or in using uh, real kinds of objects and so on. The students who are most successful, the programs most successful, there's a sense of ownership on the part of everyone involved. It's not something that's being done to them, but it's, it's a participative kind of activity. And this, this has to be the case within any organization that each, each of the members of the, of the organization from the top down has a feeling that they're part of this. They're, they're part of the decision-making process. They've bought into what the goals are and they've bought into what the processes are for accomplishing those goals. I would also add uh, that uh, since some of these technologies have now been used for several years, um, there are many uh, do well-documented case studies that are out there that, uh, that can be had where you can look at even individual industry by industry and say, yeah, there's a success story. Let's go to another live question. This from Senase, uh, the Comisión Federal de Electricidad, Senase, México, DFA. Welcome. Muy bien. Eh, I would like to begin by congratulating all the panel members for their wonderful organization on this occasion. Uh, the question is related to what you mentioned about the portable communication systems for training. Could you elaborate a little bit more as far as the equipment and the financial, um, the financial aspect of that? Thank you. I would like to congratulate all of the callers on uh, their contributions to this <laughs> program you. as well. Uh, but uh, the question of, of portability, uh, uh, Rick, you have some experience with that, and I've brought it up. Sure. I, I think that uh, portable computing, um, as, as I, I mentioned in my talk, uh, uh, computing power is coming down, down, down in cost. Um, I think one new technology that's uh, that's uh, complementary to, to that is uh, wireless local area networks. Um, we, we are installing uh, wireless systems that can uh, transmit information from a central database um, up to half a mile away yes. from that database. Uh, so I think that there can be uh, wireless systems which are uh, attached via a wireless communication link. Uh, there can also be standalone systems that uh, the database can be updated on a daily basis where the, uh, the user would plug into a database via phone line or, or something like that at the end of the day. Um, the cost of those systems is coming down uh, from ten, tens of thousands of dollars just several years ago to thousands of dollars today. Bernie or uh, Bill, would you care to comment on the the issue of, of, of portability and flexibility? Well, it just seems to me that the cost of anything that doesn't have moving parts is coming down. <laughs> and so uh, yeah, I look forward to, as a teacher myself, I look forward to the day where I can just pick up all the equipment I need and have it in my briefcase. And we can, we can do that now with an LCD panel and a, and a power book. But I want that same power because I don't want to be the center of attention. I want that same power in the hands of the people I teach as well. So I look forward to a couple of years from now for the cost of $100 or so for uh, learners to have uh, a, a, a slate that they can write on that will communicate to my computer and that we will end with each other and that we'll have an environment that is aided by technology but not centered on technology. Bill? Just to follow up on that briefly about the cost factors. One of, one, of the, one of the things that makes the cost of any technology come down is if it's useful in the consumer market. There's been a long history of that. If, if things are only useful in industrial and, and school settings, the technology seems to stay at a much uh, higher level of cost. But one of the reasons that personal computers, PCs, Macs, and so on, if the cost has dropped so dramatically, of course, is that they're, they're selling so many of them. And, and that's certainly true now with these small portable computers. As they become more popular, the price on them is going to drop dramatically, just as it has with other kinds of technology. VCR is a case in point, mm -hmm. where they become very, very inexpensive because there's such a broad market for them. Yes, yes. We've, we've gone in, in uh, a department I teach in from using three-quarter inch video exclusively, which is a higher level of video, to incorporating uh, VHS half-inch tapes because that's the consumer market. Students can make a tape, take it home, and show it to their parents. Uh, 
the consumer market has many tie-ins uh, in that way. We have a fax now from the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California Sur. It's a question that uh, uh, is more, more general, a philosophical one. In the experiences that we have now with the intelligent interaction using these types of uh, uh, technologies, uh, what are some of the philosophical issues contained in this? Uh, and what kinds of results are we experiencing on a more uh, conceptual level that way? Uh, this is a challenge I offer to any of you. <laughs> Well, uh, one that comes immediately to my mind is uh, an increased level of uh, time efficiency and productivity. Uh, the ability to uh, spend more time with your family because you're not uh, traveling or because you have access to the information you need when you need it. You don't have to uh, get in your car and, and drive to uh, a library or, or other place to research such information. So I think uh, time saving and quality of life uh, factors in there. I think also it actually changes what a faculty member does be, from being a presenter of information to perhaps a, a manager of an instructional setting. Um, there are other ways of delivering information technologically or um, having the students actually be the creators of the knowledge as Bernie is, is, is talking about. Uh, it, the, the teacher can, can then, or the trainer can then become more of a mentor. Uh, dealing one-to-one uh, -one with those people who are having specific problems or going beyond that even uh, adding to the whole instructional uh, experience or the learning experience um, rather than simply uh, being in a position to simply deliver uh, sort of a pre-canned message uh, live and that's the end of it uh, and, and also the technology permits the replication of a good lesson Oftentimes, all of us who've been in teaching situation remember those wonderful moments that, that uh, where we've had this great interaction. But if you have, say, you have two sections of the same class, it never seems to be possible to recreate that second exciting event. And if if you have it more structured and you're there as a as What's a person to facilitate the that, then it, it's much more easily easily replicated. I think that that's one of the big advantages of the technology. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, a very interesting degree to which uh, computers in particular are, are approximating human intelligence, too, and that uh, the technologies become closer to the way that our own brain operates, and that adds an additional level of, of, of challenge to this. Uh, we have a, a question, uh, a fax from uh, Pemex in uh, Villaramoso. Uh, it asks about the uh, question of whether you foresee the opportunity to get a master's or doctorate at distant sites through video conference uh, programs. Uh, can advanced degrees be obtained in this manner? I just visited uh, the University College at the University of Maryland. And they are all, in fact, they have been for quite some time. Uh, they are giving master's degrees in a wide variety of subjects, as of course are many other institutions, but they're one of the pioneers in, in this field and uh, very well established. So. The answer, I don't know about doctoral degrees. Well, one might look at Nova University, I guess, as, as, from uh, I think it's from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, as, as a case where um, they use a variety of, of technologies, uh, but um, uh, not, not just distance uh, education, but that would be one of the uh, technologies they would be using. We have a live question from SACAP. Uh, Comisión Federal de Electricidad in SACAP, uh, México, DFA. Welcome. We're calling from Mexico, from the SACAP. And our question has to do with the presentation of a, an, a team. Could you explain the the interpreter would like to ask a question. Señor, ¿está usted oyendo? Um, you mentioned something about uh, sending the signal to a ranch and then sending it down to several sites about some equipment that you mentioned. Uh, that's the question. Okay. Uh, question about uh, uh, the, the, the drop of the signal. Right. I, I think that's referring to the um, Cal Poly example with the uh, Swanton Pacific Ranch. Uh, that was a uh, the type of a, it was a, a, 
a fixed um, classroom uh, video conferencing system at Cal Poly, California Polytechnic University in San Luis Obispo, and a rollabout video conferencing system uh, at the Swanton Pacific Ranch. Uh, the exact type of, uh, of equipment there, I believe, was uh, compression labs equipment, which was operating at a um, T1 data rate, uh, 1.5 megabits per second. We have a live call from uh, 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 Comacalco, the uh, uh, Petróleos Mexicanos in Comacalco, Tabasco. Uh, welcome. Good morning. Many employees in our enterprise, in our firm, don't have the habit of reading and doing research. And so by using these techniques and this technology, how long do you think we should invest every each day in order to learn these new things for our work? <laughs> okay. How can we? Well, I, I would I would make a stab at that, and, 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 and I'd respond by saying it's going to depend to some extent on what it is that you're being expected to learn. It's also uh, a large measure. It's going to vary from one person to another. You people learn at different rates from technology, just as they do from print materials or, or any other way of, of learning. So to give an exact amount would be presumptuous, I think, on our part. Um, I think one what you might want to do is start with some fairly limited objectives, something very specific that you really wanted to accomplish, and then design materials. Uh, hopefully, if you have the technology already available, use that technology. Design the real the real critical thing, of course, is, is in how the materials are designed, not necessarily the particular technology that you're going to use to deliver it. And then start out fairly slowly and, and see how that works out. You, you, it's an iterative process where you're going to start out and do something. And, and, and somebody mentioned, I think it was Bernie, talked about having a, a win situation. You want to start out so that people succeed. That then they're going to be happy doing it. If, if they're happy, they're going to want to continue to do it. If it's if it's a if it's aversive, they're going to avoid it. So make sure they have fun doing it and and succeed. We must now wrap up this international event. Uh, Thank you very much to the many questions, comments, and insights provided today. We trust this teleconference has been of use to you. Uh, as our discussion today illustrates, professionals agree that it is an era of increasingly global issues, information, and technology. Time and distance become smaller and smaller. Facing this reality, cooperation is a must. People must be organized to provide telecommunication educational services, the systems must be designed and maintained effectively, and the technologies must be used in creative and empowering ways. We are grateful to the satellite uplink and downlink services and members of the production team here and throughout the Americas. We thank them and all of you with us today for your interest and participation. And we thank our three experts today, Dr. Broderick, Mr. Strobridge, and Dr. Dodge, we invite you back to the final three sessions of our live satellite series on telecommunications for education and professional development. The next session on September 14th focuses on video conferencing and telecommunication, technology and training. We hope you will join us then. I'm Dr. Michael Reel for all of us here in San Diego. Until the next time, thank you.